How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. I'm also a certified genetic counselor practicing in the prenatal space. On this show, we explore genetics impact on health through conversations with leaders in the field. These are experts like genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, and patient advocates. In this episode, we are exploring the genetics of ALS with Mark Keel, the chief scientific officer and co-founder of Genomenon. Mark has extensive experience in genome sequencing and clinical data analysis. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining me on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Kira. I thought we would start the conversation from baseline of just explaining what ALS is and how it's typically diagnosed for those that may not be as familiar with the disorder. Yeah, sure. It's a great starting question. So um, for those who are unfamiliar, ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it's a set of Greek words that means a lack of nourishment to the muscle. And, and that's what you see as a patient or a physician. And then the lateral sclerosis has to do with hardening of the spinal cord. Where in the spinal cord that hardening occurs is characteristic of this disease. And when you put all those things together, that equates to a motor neuron disorder, which is one of several neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And um, ALS is a rare disease. It has a, a constellation of clinical presenting symptoms that make it a little bit challenging to diagnose. And so some of the features of the diagnostic approach to ALS include the identification of both upper and lower motor neuron uh, disorder components as well as a progression of the disease. And then finally, a rule out that any other neurodegenerative or neurological disorder is at play. So the clinical diagnosis is, is what has dominated um, ALS diagnostics for, for many decades. And what causes the ALS? Have we figured out this, you know, there's probably multiple different factors when it comes to this. Yeah, so it's it's a bit of a conundrum, though we've made a great deal of progress in the past several decades. So there's a couple of components to uh, the causation of this disease. There's a handful of, of patients who have a known genetic causation, and then there's a handful of, of patients for whom no genetic uh, cause has been identified. And there's an attribution of environmental or lifestyle uh, components to causing ALS. But whether it's genetic or environmental or a combination of those things, what we do know about the pathogenetic mechanism of ALS is that it culminates on a couple of different features biomechanistically. Things like neuronal excitotoxicity, um, uh, RNA and protein handling uh, challenges, as well as oxidative stress and consequences to the glia and the neurons in those uh, regions that ALS is affecting. And as you were saying, there's genes that we've identified that can play a role in the development of ALS. Not all patients are going to have a genetic mutation that we're identifying, which maybe that's changing in the future. How many genes so far have we identified as playing a role in the development of ALS? Has this list grown in the past 30 years? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. It's actually been an astounding uh, series of, of discoveries over the past 30 years, beginning in um, the mid-90s, I believe, when the first gene was demonstrated to be associated with ALS. But, and since then, um, there have been more than three dozen genes that have been associated with um, ALS by mutation, by either a single nucleotide change or an indel or a, a repeat uh, um, expansion in, in one of the genes that's very um, well associated with causing ALS. Um, but it's important that I, I classify the types of causes uh, of ALS into sporadic and familial. And historically, those have been operationally defined, which is to say, for familial cases, if a single uh, relative of a patient who's 
who's um, presumed to have ALS also has ALS, that can constitute a familial case. And um, those comprise 10% of ALS patients, whereas the other 90% of ALS patients who don't have, have uh, a family member affected by the disease are called sporadic. And of those familial cases, uh, there's about 70% of those pa patients who have a demonstrable genetic mutation that's known to cause ALS. However, in the sporadic cases, there's still a significant fraction of those patients who also are found to have genetic mutations in those same genes that are associated with familial ALS. So the lines are, are starting to blur as we're learning more and more about the disease as a whole through research and informed by genetic sequencing, but also as we're sequencing more and more patients in the clinic, be they familial patients with uh, family members who also have the disease, as well as sequencing sporadic patients for whom no such familial relationship can be found. It also makes me think that people could have a change in one of these genes, mutation, pathogenic variant, whatever we're calling it, and not develop ALS. And we may not see that because they're not coming into the clinic. So, you know, deciphering all this information of if you have family members that have ALS and, and you also have it, like, okay, is there a genetic change there? And if you're the only one in your family with that genetic change, it's a lot of data to sift through and understand the importance and how that all works, because it's not certainly not as straightforward disease as other diseases are. It's one gene. And if you have a mutation, you yep. have that disease, whereas this is yeah. so much more levels to that. I mean, you're talking about dozens and dozens of genes that have been identified. Are all those genes on a standard genetic testing panel, if someone comes in, they have ALS, and they're looking to see, okay, can we find a genetic cause to this? Are they going to be tested for all those genes that have been discovered? Or is it only a handful at this point? Yeah, that is a great question. And, and there's a lot to unpack in that uh, question that you pose. The first is, sure, there's a genotype phenotype correlation. There's different levels of expressivity of the disease, even if you do have a mutation that your brother has. Are you going to develop the same disease? Historically, it's been challenged by uh, lifespan. It's a relatively late onset disease, on average between 45 and 50. And when uh, average lifespans were much lower, there was a, a question about whether your family members would have developed ALS had they lived long enough and not um, passed on from some other cause. But with sp specific um, uh, relevance to the genes and the testing, um, it's also been challenged by the pace of discovery of causative genes. So that makes it very hard to develop a standard panel when we're learning so much every day. Uh, that having been said, there are codified testing strategies. Uh, they typically unfold in a testing algorithm. And uh, the, the algorithm usually tests for the most common gene cause, which is C9 or F72. It's that repeat expansion mechanism that I talked about. That includes um, among the familial cases between 25 and 45 percent of those patients. And so patients, when they were trying to inform uh, 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 care of the patient and care of the family members, would initially just order that one test. And uh, it's also important to note that testing ordered in the context of a familial case. And so what you described in your question is true. Testing is easier. It's less algorithmic. So, so in the past, there would be a testing for C9 or F72 in a subset of patients. And if that were negative, there would often be no follow-on testing. And that defies our understanding of the genetics of ALS because there are three dozen other genes that could actually be the cause of the familial case or could be causing the sporadic case. And so what we're seeing now is more of a panel approach, testing all of those genes up front, and um, we're coalescing around an understanding of what should comprise a standard gene panel, though the current panels that are available vary between uh, uh, 20 genes and, and you know more than the three dozen. So I think for people listening, they may have 
done testing in the past and said, okay, I've, I've already done the testing, you know, I'm done with that. And that's really never the case with genetics of always checking back with your healthcare provider and saying, are there any updates to the genetic testing, especially if you didn't find a family mutation or a mutation in that person. Um, so it sounds like that's the case for people that had testing years ago. It's, you know, usually I hear about this more in cancer, but you know, the rules of cancer testing apply here where if you had testing, nothing came back as being found, maybe good to revisit because maybe it was just the one gene, the C9 or 72 that you mentioned. Um, now there's mm -hmm. just so many genes that we're looking at. Have you heard of patients coming in with family members and saying, you know, I want my sister to be tested. She doesn't have any symptoms, but she just wants to know, is there a risk for her? Because maybe she's a little bit younger and that age of onset um, tends to be on the older side. Or is this something that we're not doing yet? It's a fantastic question. And it allows me to emphasize that particularly in the context of ALS, there's a great deal of self-motivation among patients. There's a lot of advocacy f coming from the patients. Um, they're, they're becoming better educated about the disease and better equipped to um, exhort their clinicians to perform this kind of testing for them. So there's a great deal of that uh, groundswell of patient motivation for ALS. And in particular, when we talk about our broadening understanding of the genes that cause this disease, in addition to that, there's a deeper understanding of the variance in known genes, the evidence collected across cohorts of patients who are being sequenced and tested, as well as functional studies that test the mechanism of these individual variants. As that information gets published, that um, contributes to our understanding and ability to diagnose a patient who might otherwise have a variant of uncertain significance. The, the, the more, more apprised of the newly published information a clinician can be, the better able they will be to provide an accurate diagnosis to their patients. Do you or someone you know have Prader-Willi syndrome? Harmony Bioscience is looking for people with Prader-Willi syndrome to enroll in a new clinical study in the United States. Harmony Biosciences will be studying the safety and impact of an investigational medicine on excessive daytime sleepiness, cognition, and behavioral function in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. Use the link in the show notes to learn more about the clinical study and refer a patient to a study center. The link is also available at dnapodcast.com. Do you work in a lab? Want to receive rewards when you order supplies? Check out Thermo Fisher Scientific's Aspire program. It's a rewards program created with scientists like you in mind. All members receive a free full-size trial product every year. Points are earned every time you use or purchase products. Rewards include science-themed apparel like a zip-up DNA hoodie. Check it out at thermofisher.com slash aspire hyphen DNA today. For a limited time, you can receive 500 bonus points. Again, that's thermofisher.com slash aspire hyphen DNA today for 500 bonus points. See the show notes for terms and conditions and that link. If someone is deciding, okay, I, I don't know if I want to do the genetic testing and, and they're kind of in limbo with that decision, is there risk numbers that, say, a genetic counselor or their healthcare provider can offer them in terms of, okay, this family member has ALS, has been diagnosed, maybe they don't have their genetic test report with them for that relative. What is the range and risk that we would give like a first degree relative? So a sibling, a parent, a child of someone that has ALS, because I'm imagining this isn't just one number like we have with other Mendelian disorders where we're talking about single genes. Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll hasten to add that I'm not a clinician, though I, I was trained as um, a medical doctor. I am a pathologist in my specialty, and now I'm a data doctor. Um, but you, the question that you raise is a good one, and you can take it in two ways. In one way, before you've been tested, if there's not knowledge of a causative ge genetic variant, we can go from uh, uh, the empirical evidence to say, if we have an isolated patient with ALS, what statistically are the chances that their sibling is also going to have ALS if they're younger or if they may be pre-symptomatic. And statistically, there's an order of magnitude increased risk of a baseline 
Um, considering that ALS has such a, a constellation of causes, including environmental and lifestyle. However, if you do know that there is a genetic component, either because it was diagnosed or because there's a very strong, highly penetrant family history, that risk goes way above the order of magnitude risk. Be, you know, uh, the, the baseline is two out of every 100,000 cases in the United States. Um, individuals uh, um, rather than cases. Um, it increases by tenfold if you have a sibling with ALS, but it, it go, goes up to 50% uh, if you have a first degree relative who has ALS with a known genetic cause that's a, a dominant mechanism. Um, they're, they're taking into account issues of expressivity and um, background genomics that may help contribute or help mitigate the, the development of the disease. But again, we're talking about very significant numbers and, and that's where the patient empowerment comes into play where this now becomes a known genetic disease and all of those relevant genetic counseling tenants uh, uh, come to bear when you're talking not just about the proban, not just about the patient who was initially diagnosed, but about all of their family members. One of, the, one of the coolest things that I learned when I was going through my training was that genetic counselors don't just treat a single patient, they treat the whole family. And in this case, that's very true. And, and what we're seeing in neurology, which historically has, has not, not had many uh, genetic aspects to its clinical care, is a need for that now for diseases like ALS that are demonstrably genetic. Yeah, I think that's very well said. And just that as you know, me coming from the genetic counseling perspective, I don't work with ALS patients, I'm in prenatal, but oftentimes we're starting with one patient and that leads us to meet a lot of family members and doing a lot of testing. Um, so it's important for people to understand that genetic counselors can help you know, understand all of this. And if you have a genetic test report, that's the best thing to bring to appointments. I'm always reminding patients that if you bring a test report, we're able to help you so much more. Yeah. The other part yep. with genetic testing is that I'm wondering if it can change a person's treatment plan. So if you're able to find, okay, there's a genetic mutation in this specific gene, is that gonna change the type of treatment they're having as opposed to you have ALS, this is the standard treatment we're giving everybody yep. with ALS? That is excellent and very appropriate uh, given some recent developments in ALS uh, treatment. Um, it, it's important to note that, uh, especially in neurology, there was a reluctance to perform any genetic testing when it wouldn't inform care. Um, it's, it's important to know what the cause of a disease is if it informs its diagnosis if uh, know, that knowledge informs prognosis and if it informs treatment approaches. And previously, there was no knowledge of the genetics of ALS associating with any of those things. But what we're learning more and more is that there is, in fact, a genetic association with different prognoses. And now there's things that we can do from a treatment perspective, depending on which mutations the, in which genes the ALS patient has. So in particular, um, there are two compounds that are antisense oligonucleotide compounds. I hope I'm not mispronouncing them. Tofersen specifically targets um, gene mutations in the SOD1 gene, which is, uh, I think, 20% of familial patients, so a, a significant number of patients. And then JC Fusen uh, targets the the variants in the FUS gene, which I think accounts for maybe 5 or 10% of familial patients. And there's newer compounds that are in phase one trials, those former two are in phase three trials, and showing very promising results that, that target um, uh, mutations in the C9RF72 gene, that repeat expansion that we talked about, that comprises a significant number of familial cases, though those are in phase one trials. The results are preliminary. Tofferson and J.C. Fusen are showing a great deal of promise and necessitating, in my view, sequencing for all patients, whether they're familial or sporadic, because that will inform care. 
It'll be for a minority of those patients, but for those patients, there's a great deal of promise that um, th these interventions will will prolong and improve the quality of life for those, those patients. And as we've seen for other genetic disorders, when medication is developed specifically for certain pathogenic variants in certain genes, so it's like, okay, you have a variant in a certain gene, and so we're going to prescribe this medication, then other genes follow suit. So as you're saying, it's not just those specific genes, there'll probably be others in the future. And especially if you're hitting ones that a good chunk of ALS patients have, then you're able to provide personalized medicine was really what we're talking about here to those patients with specific drugs to target that. Um, we've seen this in with people with cystic fibrosis. We did a whole series on that of just the different drugs designed for mutations in different gene genes and really lining those up. Um, and a lot of this for ALS, I was really intrigued to learn more about with your comprehensive genomic landscape for ALS report, where you get into a lot of this information and it's really well written, I have to say, of just like reading through the report. Um, <laughs> what are some of the key findings from this that you were surprised by, the big takeaway messages from, you know, what the company found? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, all praise for the writing goes to to um, uh, my team members, Lauren Chun in particular was spearheading a lot of this um, uh, investigation and the, the report writing. Um, I'll back up and, and describe what our approach was, what, what it means to say a comprehensive genomic landscape. So um, the genomenon specializes in genetic and genomic evidence coming from the empirical literature over the many decades of scientific and clinical inquiry. And for any disease, not just ALS, and for any gene, not just the you know three dozen or so genes we've been talking about, we have a great understanding of where those genes and diseases are, are described in the empirical literature and what variants are described and in which patients and what are all of the attendant clinical and, and biomechanistic uh, descriptions of those genes and variants and proteins and patients and their, their diseases. And, and so particularly for ALS, what we're talking about when we say a comprehensive genomic landscape, that means every single variant ever published in any one of those 36 genes, which it numbers over 20,000, 7,000 of which were known to be associated with ALS. We know every one of the papers that describes all of those variants, and we have clinically assessed that evidence for actionability, pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants based on defined clinical grade criteria we have that great compendium of information uh, from all of those genes and from all of those patients in all of those references. And we've annotated that data around things like age of onset, the, um, uh, the rate of progression of the disease characterized in each of those individual patients, and the relative prevalence of those gene mutations across sporadic and familial cases. And so some of the findings that we up with are that there's a demonstrable association with patients who have G mutations in certain genes with earlier ages of onset and with more aggressive progression of disease. And some of that had been known before, but not in this you know, grand view, very detailed, very exhaustive, comprehensive approach. As a, as a case in point, um, there are certain mutations within a gene that confer a, a, a more aggressive disease, an earlier age of onset, whereas other mutations in that same gene don't confer as aggressive a disease. And so when you, you think about the, the depth of that analysis amortized across all of those references and all of those patients and all of those genes, what we're able to do is see patterns emerge to, to lend better and more clarity to the, the pathogenetic mechanism of disease, as well as the clinical presentation and behavior of those patients. If you have patients with Prader-Willi syndrome, please let them know about a new clinical study looking for participants across the United States. Harmony Biosciences will be studying the safety and impact of an investigational medicine. The study will focus on excessive daytime sleepiness, cognition, and behavioral function in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. The study participation is four months long and consists of five visits. If you're a patient, at your visits, you will participate in sleep tests and have general check-ins on how you're feeling. You'll also need to keep a sleep diary for the first two weeks and a closing diary once you start treatment. 
If you're a caregiver, you'll attend all visits with the patient and help provide information to the trial researchers. There are 13 trial sites in the United States, and Harmony Biosciences will reimburse patients to travel to their closest site. Refer yourself, a patient, or a loved one to the study by visiting the link in the show notes, which is also available at dnapodcast.com. And it's all summarized in this one report, which it sounds like it would be hundreds of pages long, and it's not. It's it's so greatly just packaged to understand and, and see, as you said, that the age of onset can depend on which gene is involved. And going deeper, as you said, that just what the genetic changes within the gene can also make a difference. Um, that was really intriguing to me that it's not just, okay, what gene is it? Okay, this one is involved with earlier onset or this one makes it more aggressive. Um, but, you know, going into the fine details of the spelling of the gene and where that mistake is and, and what it is to lead to that. Do you see this information being used to help with clinical trials and figuring out how to group people and helping with some of this drug development and trying it with subsets of people that have a mutation in this gene and maybe looking at even like they have a certain mutation and then trying that. Um, do you see this being a way that the information is going to be used in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. In fact, it, it is being applied to clinical trials for ALS. As I suggested before, Genomenon uh, works with all manner of genetic disease, not just rare disease, not just neurodegenerative disease, but also cancer and, and other forms of monogenic disease. Um, in specific relation to ALS and the data that we put together in this comprehensive report, all of that detailed information that was summarized in the report, the detailed per variant level information across those thousands of, of genetic variants is applicable to clinical trial design, divining inclusion or exclusion criteria based on the evidence that's been assembled um, enrolling patients into trials for some of these targeted compounds, for instance, based on the evidence that's uh, accumulated in this comprehensive report to ensure that the most appropriate patients and the, the, the maximum number of those appropriate patients are able to be enrolled in these trials to ensure the, the success of the trial, right patients with the right treatment as is necessitated by these precision therapies, but also not leaving anybody out if there is enough evidence to indicate that they're likely to respond. And so you, you know very well about the variant of uncertain significance challenge, the, the big hump of variants in the, in the bell curve, where the majority of variants across any gene fall into that category. Our goal with this approach was to flatten that hump as much as we can based on the evidence still ensuring the utmost accuracy of that interpretation, uh, but just ensuring that we don't miss any of that evidence because uh, manually identifying that information is such a challenge. Genomenon's automated approach uh, ensures the, the utmost sensitivity of finding that evidence and bringing it to bear for clinical purposes. And that's really useful for healthcare providers to have access to as well, because if they have a patient that has a VUS, as we're saying, variant of unknown significance, looking at that and saying, okay, it's been a few years, I've been seeing this patient, let me see if there's any updates with that. And that could provide more information at that point. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we're, we're seeing that in all manner of disease as next generation sequencing, I'm, I'm dating myself a bit, uh, it, it's been around for, for a long time, but I remember it, um, it not being a thing in the clinic. Right. I remember when we were uh, doing Sanger sequencing and looking at these you know, single mutations, well, now we have the ability to sequence across the entire genome and for about the same cost as a single variant analysis. And what we're, what we're seeing is that is uh, true in the clinic as much as it is true in the research realm. And that great burden of new information that's being uh, published year over year, sometimes month over month or you know week by week, is accumulating and informing the interpretation of all these other variants. And so there's a, a great need to stay on top of that information as a patient, as a clinician, as a researcher. And that's one of the, the things that the comprehensive landscapes that we produce are able to provide because they're kept up to date on a, on a week 
weekly, quarterly, or yearly basis as needed. That's fantastic because it just takes so much time to sift through all this data. So for people to be able to access already funneled information is fantastic. And people can check out Genomenon's comprehensive genomic landscape for ALS report uh, by going to the show notes for this episode. We're going to have a direct link to it. And also in the blog post for this episode available at dnapodcast.com. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming on the show and just sharing all of this and exploring all the details with this because I am not as familiar with ALS and I learned so much in this episode. Um, So I just really want to thank you for bringing your expertise on the show and for everything that you guys do to help bring more information to the public to be able to help understand ALS and, and so many more disorders that Genomenon is able to provide that extra information. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You guys can check out DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and connect with us there. Any questions for myself or Mark, you can send into info at dnapodcast.com. And we would love if you could rate and review the show on Apple. That is really how we're able to get new listeners and new sponsors to attract us. So please take a moment, rating and review on Apple. It will take you approximately 60 seconds. So please do that. Thanks for listening, everybody. Join us next time to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. Do you like science-themed apparel? If you follow us on Instagram at DNA Radio, you've seen how much I love genetic shirts, jewelry, masks, you name it. That's why I want to tell you about Thermo Fisher's Aspire program. It's a rewards program created with scientists like you in mind. Points earned every time you use or purchase lab products. Then you can redeem those points for fun, science-themed apparel, career and educational items, and more. One of my friends in the program got a DNA hoodie, and it was clearly designed by a genetics nerd because you zip up the base pairs. Here's a bonus. As a Thermo Fisher Aspire member, you will receive a free full-size trial product every year. You can also use points to get full-size products from their catalog that you haven't tried before. With over 100,000 kits, reagents, antibodies, and other products to select from, you'll be sure to find many valuable options for your research. Best of all, you'll get a full-size products, not just samples, so you'll have enough to really experiment with. Anyone can join. You don't need to be a purchaser. So check it out at thermofisher.com slash aspire hyphen DNA today to cash in those 500 bonus points. Again, that's thermofisher.com slash aspire hyphen DNA today for 500 bonus points. See the show notes for terms and conditions and that link. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. 